Our first speaker is Noel Sharkey, Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics and co-director of the Foundation for Responsible Robotics and chair of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. Noel is on the front line of the latest innovations around robotic technology and also on the front line when it comes to the ethics of robot tech applications and what they mean for democracy, war and policing. We're looking forward to hearing what he has to say, but if you want to read about what he has to say, you can buy Noel um, Org's book on digital threats for the next 10 years, which has a chapter by Noel in that book exploring these issues in more detail. Um, so, without further ado, I'll hand over to Noel for the first session. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning. It's a very good morning. Just when we're talking about surveillance, can you all smile? <laughs> See if I can, uh... So I'm just setting a timer for myself because I don't trust other people. Not all really, I don't think. Um, here's some other simple ones. That's a sort of Chinese one that's a tourist one, really. And you can press it and ask questions or say, police come quickly, someone's robbing me. Uh, there's one in Dubai where you can actually pay your taxes through it. Uh, this is a Japanese show robot. This Russian one here is quite interesting because what, it, what it's for is for getting drunks off the street. So if it finds someone drinking, it comes up to them and says, take, get off the street with that alcohol. And then it keeps doing that louder and louder till it's going, get off the street with that alcohol, until they go. So that, that's, not, that's not a bad application either. This is one that uh, shoots a net at people. And it works well, providing they stand exactly still like this. And that's really good. But you can see the, the intent here. Now, um, this is where it starts to not get so good. So we, you all know that we've had police surveillance uh, robots or little drones in the UK for quite a long time now. In fact, right, I mean, I, I've known about them since 2006. I've been talking to the police about them since then. And they, they sort of buzz about, you know, looking at us from, from on high or from down low. And in fact, in, in um, I think it was about 2012, the Guardian found out that five of our police forces were meeting with BAE Systems. BAE Systems is our major defence contractor that we underwrite as taxpayers. And they were working with the Home Office and developing this idea of using autonomous drones now, they said, of course, all the PR was, it was for stopping people coming into our country, these horrible immigrants uh, crossing our border. It was about dangerous crime and finding lost children, rescuing people from fires. So the Guardian used freedom of information to get, get the transcripts of the meetings. And it turned out it was for things like anti-social behavior, fly posting, fly tipping, a whole range of very trivial crimes. So that's what they were up to. It was going to be general surveillance of the population. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't really mind too much. It's a bit of a slip if, if, if these things are used for, for very serious crime or finding people who are just about to blow me to pieces with a suicide vest on. But we have to be very careful with it. And, and I know from my own experience of, of lobbying that you can't ask for too much at any time. So the only thing I'm asking of, of the police is one, one thing, is that each time they use these for surveillance, they're signed out in the way you would sign out a weapon, by a magistrate signing the paper. And that protects us from just these fishing exercises. I mean, fishing exercises can lead to all sorts of weird things. Uh, and I'll give you an example of, of one I found. It's not with a drone, but in Sheffield, my, where I live, um, there, was a, there was a teacher, a gay teacher, who uh, picked somebody up in, in, in the city, and they got into a car and drove out to the middle of the peaks in the middle of nowhere and had sex in the car. Now, police saw them doing this, followed them out into the peaks, and then arrested them for having sex in public. But the only public there were the police who had followed them. And they, they tried to, they, they rang the school immediately and tried to get the, uh, the man expelled from the school as a teacher. Luckily for him, the person that they got was the assistant of the, uh, you know, the trustees, and he was a judge. 
And he said, I'm not having this. And he fought the case and, and, and the guy got off. But if you imagine if a drone comes overhead and sees you up to doing something like having sex somewhere that you shouldn't be in, in the middle of nowhere. You're now in a public place. So that's the kind of thing that you, we really don't want these things in our lives. But this is worse now because the, the, country, the state that uses them most is North Dakota in the United States. And in 2015, November, they passed a bill allowing the police to use these, arm them with uh, so-called sublethal or non-lethal weapons, which we all know are not really non-lethal, but non-lethal weapons, so they could shoot people from, from the sky. And that's in the United States, and I'm sure they would be very happy to do that. Um, now, that's another one. I'm not sure if that's going to be a video or not. I think I'm... Yes, it is. Yes, that, that's one that delivers low-velocity tear gas. I don't know if there's any sound on that, is there? I'm not sure. It might be silent. So it's a riot control system. <laughs> yeah, you noticed that too. <laughs> <laughs> Now this one, this is one that I've been following for quite a while. This is called the Skunk Drone, and it's made in South Africa by a company called Desert Wolf, just here. And this one fires tear gas, that's, that's there. They fire tear gas, and they also um, fire plastic balls and can cover protesters with, with paint. Now these were designed specifically for busting miner strikes, because they had a lot of problems striking miners. And they, they, when they first opened, that was in 2013 or 2014, they said they'd sold 25 of these and to some law enforcement agencies abroad, and they wouldn't say where. But now if you try to buy them, they only sell them in, in, in blocks of 50, and they've had to open a new factory in Oman and Brazil. The demand is so heavy. But they won't say who's using them. I know that China have bought them, Turkey have bought them, and so have India. Uh, we haven't, as far as I know. Unfortunately, uh, you can see what these would be very good for. I, I've got actually got the only video that can be found on this anywhere. So that's what it really looks like. They keep it very secret. So these are all remote control from somebody on the ground. I think that's just repeating. It's a GIF, I think. You can see it looks pretty nasty. So it's one of the concerns is breaking up public protest. And this gives a very different kind of reach than police trying to control a crowd because the police are nowhere to be seen. These are all above them. And these less, less than lethal weapons, if you've seen the amnesty report in this from some time ago, you can see that they're not really, I mean, they call it less than lethal weapons and every cell, oh, it's okay, it's, it's a sub-lethal weapon, but they're not okay. They maim people and kill them. That's the result of a plastic, a rubber bullet. You can see this is, this is as well. So it's less than lethal. As it doesn't give me any, any good feeling. So it's the next stage that's really bothering me, and that's the use of autonomous robots. So they will select their own targets and go after them themselves without human intervention. I'll just show you what they... And these are being developed mainly by our militaries, including the UK. Um, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you, this is just an explanation of what happens. So as soon as the lever is pulled, I showed this in Denmark for the first time, that's why. They, um, as soon as the lever is pulled, the weapon is completely under computer control. And that means that information comes in from sensors into the computer, that gets processed, and then a signal is sent to a weapon or to a motor to drive it, you know, so it will turn it or, or drive a motor, and no human in control. And the big problem here is how good are the sensors? And I can tell you they're not very good. They're not up to the job at all. In terms of military, you can't really determine the difference between a civilian and a soldier reliably or between a military object and a civilian object reliably. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, why we don't want to use these. And in fact, I, well, I'll show you next. I'll show you a little what a killer robot is. So... This is a simple one, and I could make this for you, you know, tomorrow and bring it in here and kill all of you but not damage the furniture. And that's because it, the, I use heat sensors here like you have in your household alarm systems, that kind of thing. 
And the program is simple. If heat detected on one sensor, rotate the robot until heat detected on both sensors and then fire the weapon. This is a little person coming along here. Heat's detected in one sensor, it turns. Now, militaries don't want to use this directly because it would be completely against the laws of war. So at least they have to pretend that it's got something to do, some connection to the laws of war. And they might believe that it does. But that is the, that is the aim for the militaries. And, but there are a lot of problems with this. And he, here's one of the problems. So, so the big thing today is that, oh, we can fix everything. Neural, neural networks or machine learning, I worked in the field for 25 years, can fix everything. You just give it lots and lots of examples, and it will learn to detect an enemy or, a, or a, somebody with a rifle or something else. So this is a neural net here. I'll show you this video. that has been trained. It's strangely trained on examples of rifles, grenades, and turtles. <laughs> and some other things as well. So it's a, a turtle recognition system. But what, the, what they have cleverly done here is change one pixel in that 12 million pixel photograph. One pixel. This was working at very high accuracy until they changed that one pixel. Then they show you what happens when you change five pixels. I hope it runs now. That's that, the, the red one there is the, is the rifle one. So that's... It's a 3D printed tur turtle. And it's always classified as a turtle after the network has been trained. So that's when they've put in, changed one pixel. It can't tell whether it's a turtle or a rifle. It thinks it's a rifle now because it's changed one pixel. Is that the end of that? It must be. Um, so so we have what we have at the moment, despite this sort of thing, we have the United States going crazy for these weapons. They've developed autonomous submarines, fighter craft, tanks, flotillas of small ships, and swarms. Swarms is a big thing. So you have a swarm of these because it's what you call a force multiplier. One person can unleash a, unleash a swarm of autonomous fighter jets, especially for use in China, in the Pacific. And my worry is that these are going to come back into policing. Now, the problems in policing are quite different from the problems in military. Um, it's not right to just go and kill people. You might not think that when you read the news in America, but, it, but it's not acceptable in, in all the codes. And one thing I should say is we're, we're working very hard at the UN, have been for the last five years, to get a new international treaty to ban these. And we're making very good headway. We're, we're meeting next two weeks' time with a group of governmental experts at the UN it's from 90 nations to discuss what to do with them. But even if we get a complete treaty ban, it does not stop the police using them. It only stops the military from using them. And that's the case with things like tear gas. The military can't use tear gas, but the police can. So they'd still be able to use these if we get a complete ban. Now, in, in policing, I don't usually use... Uh, you know, text on my slides as you can see but you have to have a graded use of force so you've got the right to life which, can, which is a non-derogable life uh, a non-derogable right so you always have the right to life you can't have it taken away from you but sometimes other people's rights override them like my right to self-defense so what you can do then is you have to, it has to be absolutely necessary to protect human life has to constitute a last resource, and it has to be applied in a proportionate manner to the threat. There's no way you can do that with an autonomous system. It's impossible. I'm not going to read all that, but that, that's the same sort of thing. I just put that up there to let you see that it's enshrined in the principles at, at the UN, but nonetheless. So, autonomous. This is autonomous. I'm going to show you an autonomous system here. Now, this can only be... You'd only ever see something like this in Texas at the minute. It's fully autonomous. It, it goes on top of uh, your property. It sits, sits on top of your property, uh, looking around, observing. And then if you enter, if someone enters your property, it tells them to leave. And if they don't, it fires a taser dart at them. And according to them, keeps them under electric shock until the police arrive. Now, I'm going to show you a little video clip here where they tested it out on their intern. Uh, <laughs> And what you, won't see, what you won't see at the beginning is the intern having a complete medical check, having his heart checked and everything else. But if you're an intruder, you're not going to have your heart checked. So a taser could kill me, for instance, a taser dart. And it's slightly fantasy. I'll explain why in a second. But you can see the idea. 
So Amazon delivers packages. This is their advert. We deliver in. Here's the office intern, Jackson Sheehan. Quite literally taking one for the team. <laughs> If you were to continue to advance, or if you were to try to take out the drone, then it can make several semi-autonomous and autonomous decisions on whether it should tase you or not, and then it can continue to tase you until the authorities arrive. Why I say that's a slight fantasy, because the payload in these things is not that great, so you, you would not have the, have the battery power up there to tase you for very long. But, but you get the idea. I mean, you could have a bigger one that could hold more battery. And that would, be, that would be a shame. But that, that's the kind of thing. I said to The Guardian in 2006, as a joke, they were interviewing me about something, but as a joke, I said, um, I don't want to be going up an alleyway after being out to the pub to have a pee and I get tasered from the sky. But they published it, though. <laughs> so it wasn't really a joke. Uh, but it isn't a joke now. Okay, so this is the riot bot. This is another one. So I'm just showing you all this technology. This is the one on the ground. So it's, you, can, you can see that it has, uh, fires these PAVA balls, which are, which are sort of gas. Um, so that can be used to crowd control as well. Here's, here's one here. You can see it. This is one used by the SWAT teams in the United States, of course. Uh, can hold grenade launchers, machine guns, Barrett rifles, anti-tank rocket launchers. And quite often, SWAT teams in the United States use these completely unarmed to take in a telephone or pizza when there's a hostage situation. And what they find is that quite often when they send one in, people come out with their hands up because they don't know what a robot is, so they, they surrender to it. But they've been used quite a lot. Uh, there's one instance in Texas. I mean, it's, it's not terribly bad the way they've been used, not the armed ones. There was an incident in Texas where a couple were holed up. They, they were to be evicted, and they wouldn't give up, and they, had, they were armed. And so the SWAT team was there, and they had fought for about six hours, uh, shooting, shooting all the time. And I think the, the, the man in the couple was dead, and the woman wouldn't surrender. She was still there armed. And they sent one of these in with a gripper on it, grabbed her by the ankle and pulled her out peacefully. So, so it's, that wasn't too bad. It all sounds all very well, but it's all moving in the wrong direction for me. I find it quite alarming. And this one particularly. So in July 7, 2016, we had the first kill by a, by a police robot. Now this was remote controlled. It wasn't, it wasn't an autonomous robot. And it was a particularly dangerous situation. And the trouble is with, with emergency and dangerous situations is they can have a really pernicious effect on our society afterwards. Like the Jamie Bulger incident, if you remember in the 80s, is what made uh, cameras and, and our, C our complete coverage of CCT, it made it palatable to the general public because they caught the murderer using a couple of cameras in a, in a shopping mall. In this case, a sniper had killed six policemen and six others were seriously wounded and he wouldn't give up and so he was holed up in the place. So they took this robot here, put plastic explosives on its arm and sent it in and blew him to pieces. They actually sent it into the room behind where he was and blew it through the wall and blew him to pieces. And, you know, the lawyer said that was okay, it was extreme self-defence and the police said, yes, we've got to protect our, our policemen at all costs but not really, because it's okay for this emergency situation, but what about the next time it happens? What, what is a dangerous threat to the police? Is an angry crowd shouting, pigs, kill the pigs, or something? Is that a threat to the police? Can they then use a robot? So I'm waiting to see what the, what the next move will be. But it's just, it's just a sliding down this, this slope. Um, this is an Israeli one called the Guardian, and that's fully autonomous. Though the, now that we've stuck, once we started this campaign, you cannot find, a, this is a, an old picture that I happened to save, you cannot find one with a gun on it anymore. Um, and they say that, oh yeah, the, but the gun's remotely controlled from a distance. So that, so that it changes the way people, uh, the narrative a bit. So that's just been replaced with, with this one. And that patrols the, the Palestine border. And if any intruder comes in, they shoot them. So that, that's the idea. And this one's moving towards full autonomy, as you can see there. It's, it's semi-autonomous at the moment. 
Now, I'm not against use of autonomous robots for anything. I mean, that's my passion. I've worked, on, worked developing and building for many years. What I'm concerned about is the f targeting of people and the shooting of them, as far as, as far as these autonomous ones are concerned. Now, the um, Dubai police have been really getting into robots. They're trying to develop the most high-tech uh, country in the world to match their really high-tech city. And so they have this silly little thing which doesn't look, well, doesn't look too harmful, but when you read, by 2030, we will have the first smart police station that would, requ would not require human employees. So they want to really go for full autonomy of robotics. This robot, I actually know, but it belongs to the royal family, and I've been out there, and I actually did a show for the royal family to illustrate how it worked, because they, they didn't know what their own robot did. Uh, and it's a very, very good one. It can localise itself. I mean, it, it's excellent. But at the moment... It's just that you can pay parking fines to it as well. So it's nothing, nothing too serious. And then they have this one. Oh, you can see it moving there. It's kind of publicity stuff, but it's just, it's just the direction it's moving in. Now, this is their, this is their new thing, uh, which is going to have very strong implications for policing. It's fully autonomous air taxis. And they've got two, two companies making these at the moment. You can see it here. I'm not getting in this, I'll tell you. So you just get into it, you press the coordinates that you want to go to on the screen and off it goes and takes you there. But this is the kind of technology they're developing that's going to have strong implications as we go into the future. So you just press it and off it goes. And here's, here's, the, here's the other one. That's a Chinese one. This is a German one that carries two passengers. I'm sort of showing these to lighten the mood a little bit. <laughs> so it's a bit stuff's a bit scary. So here's, here's another one they've got. You can see the sort of thing they're developing. Advanced anomaly detection. So this will detect an intruder coming over a fence. They're not weaponized yet, but of course they're going to be. I mean, these, these things are being used for border control around the world as well. I haven't, haven't got time to go into all of that. So this is detected an intruder. And it's sent out a little drone. It's got its own little drone that it can send out automatically when it detects an intruder. So very high-tech policing. But, but what's the little drone going to do? It's going to follow him, and then he'll run away and he'll hide somewhere. So the only thing they can do is to shoot him, really. And that's going to happen for sure. I think I've just about... I was trying to give enough time here for questions, because that's important to me. Yep. So you talked about um, the limitations of sensors. Um, if, if you would like to, would you break that down a little into the limitations of the sensors themselves versus the limitations of the sensor processing. Yeah. Maybe say something about how you see that shifting over time as well. Um, sensing, sensors themselves are, are becoming brilliant. Small, high-tech, incredible camera resolution is stunning. And also we can um, use cameras, we can train cameras now. I mean, you can take billions of pixels and train it in picture recognition. So it's the actual processing itself that's difficult. Um, but, of course, committing a crime is not a visual category, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. you know, it might be good for face recognition. And even face recognition, I mean, <laughs> there's various ways you can... You can there's, a, there's an arts project in Europe that shows you just put a couple of stripes on yourself and you don't look like yourself. And there's even a project now in the United States where you can put on a pair of glasses and it makes the thing think you're a, a particular celebrity. So they're quite easy to fool. But the actual visual sensing itself, it looks like it's doing really, really well because Google are looking at videos and you know, collecting, you know, collecting photographs and videos. They do millions and millions of these things. But when you get out in the real world, depth perception, shadows, all those things really can't be done. Um, but what worries me more is the idea of being able to have a proportionate response, mm -hmm. knowing, that, knowing what someone's intention is because it's working out what their intention is. And that's very difficult. And we know it's difficult because the, the RMI5, or MI6, uh, MI5 it was, had a big project on recognising intention. And they gave up the project because of the 7-7 bombers. One of the 7-7 bombers stopped at a petrol station on the way to dr deliver the bomb, got shortchanged, and got into a fight 
with the, uh, with the staff at the petrol station over 10p. And that did not look like somebody who was on their way to deliver a bomb. So. Where could we find these images that you shared with us? Because I'd like to obviously download these and share them with the people or off-grid. Which images? Well, like the um, autonomous robots that you've shown there. Well, you just, just go onto YouTube and you'll find everything there. Oh, really? Yeah. Because yeah. I've only ever known about things like Petman and so on from Boston Dynamics. So, you know, that, that was scary in itself and Big Dog as well. And it's not armed either. I like those. One more point I'd like to make, um, <laughs> I think, which we haven't covered, is obviously this is all well and good, but the human accountability then is taken out of the equation, isn't it? And exactly. That, that's the, the big problem, isn't it? Yeah. Because someone should be a, accountable for these things. Yeah. Well, the organisation I run called uh, Responsible Robotics, that's what we push the whole time. There must always be a clear chain of human accountability in any robot application. And the EU recently tried to brought a new bill to, to the Parliament. They voted yes on it. And part of that was to give two parts of it. One was to give a robot uh, citizenship, personhood, which is completely daft, but the other part wasn't so daft, and that's to give a, a robot legal personhood. Now, legal personhood, uh, lawyers have been talking about this for ages for robots because companies, corporations have legal personhood. They're not persons, and you can't individually sue the directors. Uh, so the idea was to give robots the same kind of legal personhood and then kind of put money into the robot's account so that if anything happens or any accidents, the robot is held accountable and responsible, which is just, we're completely against that. It's just a slimy way of avoiding prosecution. I don't, frankly, I don't like the whole idea of corporate mm -hmm. having personhood. I mean, I think that's really awful. So anyway, I don't know if that answered your so, question. Uh, I was amazed to hear you say that it's possible for a technology to be banned from the military by international treaty for being unconscionable to use and yet still be allowed to be used by police forces. Yes. In which, is that true here? In which countries is it true? Is it true in every country? And how did it end up that way? Well, it's, that just seems mad. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that the police would use it. It wouldn't, be legal. it wouldn't be legal to use it in the way it stands at the moment at all, I don't think. But there's countries, I mean, there's lots of countries that flaunt the law all the time, so there's no way of, of stopping them using them. Um, but the, the way you get around that, and uh, Christoph Haynes, who's the Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Killings in 2012, went to the Human Rights Council of the UN. They're the appropriate body there, and talked about these weapons, but they weren't interested. And uh, nations have told, we've had, we've had meetings, I've had meetings with so-called friendly nations, about 20 nations, uh, saying, should we take this to the Human Rights Council? And we asked for a show of hands, and it was, it was um, completely consensus that, no, we shouldn't. They don't want us to go to the Human Rights Council with it. We're going to anyway, but they don't want us to. The UN's very difficult to work with. It's very slow. It's very treacherous. Um, nobody says no to anything. They just sort of find ways of putting obstacles in your path all the time. The UK is one of the worst for this, by the way. The UK has said um, they will never use these weapons and therefore they won't support a ban on them. Do you get that logic? Because I, I can't, you know. And the reason why they will never use these weapons is they say they won't exist and they're out of step with every other nation on the planet because everybody else defines the nations, everybody else defines these weapons as weapons that once you switch them on, they go out and kill people, target them, track them without human control. The UK defines them as weapons that have their own intentions and are aware. Now, I have humiliated them about this for years in various public places, even in Parliament and uh, at the UN, and they've said, oh, well, well, you know, that was some fool wrote that. They produced a report, the uh, Joint Doctrine Note, a month ago, and the, the uh, <coughs> definition is back in there again. So it's, it's outrageous. I mean, the, I don't know what, what the UK are playing at. And BAE Systems is developing uh, an aut autonomous tank now. They already have an autonomous fighter plane. They're developing an autonomous tank and autonomous support systems. So, Yes. Um, Sorry. I mean, looking at this book by Professor Living in the Fascist Country, by Professor Vanolo Coleman, at which he talked about what he called radio frequency identification of which perhaps you might be aware of, that somebody or some other people 
that perhaps I have, or rather I'm aware of, have been affixed with the really fruit and certification by which have been what, sorry? Have been affixed, affixed with the radio frequency identification by which they can never hide from any what they call science, TV, radio, computer, or something like that, by which your activities, utterances, whatever you're doing, and all the things is monitored in the central studio of the BBC or the TV you might be looking at or the radio you might be listening to. And this is something that has impacted actually, in particular, to people they regard as activists whose opinions they fear because either they violate their entrenched conservative attitudes around these things, mm. and therefore they become people who must be a danger to society, not only society, but a danger to the establishment in particular, by which people of color like me, or black actually, is completely looked at as Aryan, not Aryan in, in, the, particular, in the sense of um, animal or something, but uh, of which perhaps we are described as. But uh, we become very particularly verified, not only verified as, as, a, as, as a personality, but completely his health and the physical well-being might be also be completely yeah. be completely be completely compromised. Either health was around the thing, of which actually in this book we talk about and all yes. things, of which you talk about actually in particular black people. Why do you say about it? You make a very good point. Uh, I mean the I didn't talk about how artificial intelligence is being used by the police for predictive policing. And it's quite clear that it's totally racially biased, completely. Um, we have something in the UK, I'll just say this quickly, called the gang matrix. And it's being used by the Metropolitan Police. I only discovered this. I mean, I do some work with Amnesty International, and they're on the case. The gang matrix, uh, what it does is it's an algorithm that looks at people and their, their activities, where they go and everything else, and you get onto the gang matrix without any evidence whatsoever that you're in a gang. If you're black, you're pretty likely to be on that matrix. You don't know you're on the matrix, there's no right of appeal, but then they write to people's neighbours and ask them to spy on them. That's how they find out about it. Or people are getting evicted from their houses by the council and there's no evidence against it. I mean, this is completely against human rights, and Amnesty now have a whole series of freedom of information requests to try and find out what's going on. But that kind of bias is persisting in predictive policing, and even in job applications, insurance applications, algorithms use big data, historical data, and they're both biased in gender and in terms of race. But the good news for you, which wasn't good news to a talk I went to, I was talking in a panel with Deep Mind two days ago in London for Wired, Wired Festival, and um, I had Joy Butowini uh, on the panel, and she was talking about invisibility of coloured people. And she showed that there was a face recognition system, and she stared straight at it, it did nothing. You couldn't see anything. Was she was completely invisible. Then she put on a white mask and she was completely visible. So, but, I mean, that was terrible because of the bias. But at the same time, I said to her afterwards, you're lucky, you're, at least you're invisible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that could be a good thing. Sorry, this, I think I've just got time for this last question. About the civilian or police use of arms, every single technology that hasn't been weaponized yet will eventually be weaponized. Now, the Protocol of Rome that established the Tribunal of the Hague for International Crimes Against Humanity, Section 2, Article 7, allows yes. to prosecute people in times of peace. So the civilian usage by police of weapons that are considered illegal can be prosecuted and should be sometimes prosecuted. So what do you think and what are people doing about getting somebody, somebody in the planet, prosecuting for using arms in civilian, against civilian in peacetime. It's happening all the time. There's cases being prosecuted by the likes of Reprieve, for instance, who, who oh, my time's up. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're prosecuting, but they don't often win. And oh, by the way, just the last point is that Obama put an executive order in place to stop the militarization of the police in the United States and uh, Trump has torn, torn up the executive order. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.